Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Mihaela Ginn. I've had the pleasure of working with Mihaela on a number of different projects, and I'm happy that she was agreed to be my co-chair. Uh, I can say without hesitation that all the good things that have happened in this conference are her fault, and all the bad things are my fault. Uh, Mihaela is the radio pharmacy operations lead at the PET MRI TGH MRI research supervisor. Toronto General Hospital. Can you imagine all those acronyms? Anyway, <clears throat> Mahela is the operations lead, uh, at the, and she's also the radio pharmacy lead. She's responsible for all operational and regulatory aspects of daily manufacture and distribution of radio pharmaceuticals to five hospitals in Toronto's downtown core. So that's quite a feat. She also oversees the practical and theoretical training in radio pharmacy of nuclear medicine residents at the Faculty of Medicine and the University of Toronto. She has more than 15 years experience in the field of radio pharmaceutical development. Prior to joining the UNH, Mihaela was a senior scientist at the Center for Probe Development and Commercialization in Hamilton and a regional radio pharmacist at Vancouver Coastal Health. She received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Basel in Switzerland. Why she ever came here, I don't know. And holds a master in science in organometallic chemistry from the University of Lille, France. Mihaela, please. Thank you so much, Doug, for your very kind introduction. And it's not true, all the good things are because of you. And welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, I will speak uh, to the other spec, diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals that are not covered by tech. And I know at time, um, my uh, presentation could uh, seem tedious and a bit descriptive. Uh, some of these uh, radiopharmaceuticals are, are being phased out. Of, uh, from nuclear medicine use, but I think since this is a course that they are um, worth mentioning. And I'm sorry, but my camera is on the way. I cannot see the presentation. Just one second. Okay. So this is the outline. I'll speak towards the, uh, again, all diagnostic iodine-based um, uh, pharmaceuticals, indium-111, thallium-201, gallium-67, just mentioning xenon-133, and then I will end with radio labeling of uh, autologous cells. Now, iodine, why iodine? Well, iodine has a plethora of radioisotopes that are of relevance uh, in the medical field, and it also has a stable isotope, uh, that can be used uh, for modeling radio labeling reactions. And the most relevant ones are this one highlighted, iodine-123, uh, a gamma emitter, iodine-124, a positron emitter, iodine-125, a very low uh, energy uh, gamma emitter and a beta emitter, and iodine-131, the original uh, theranostic, uh, a beta and a high, uh, high beta and high gamma uh, emitter. In general, halogens are very relevant for, for nuclear medicine. They are located in group 7A or 17 of the periodic table of um, elements. Uh, their chemistry is well understood. Um, they form stable covalent bonds. Um, their steric and um, electronic nature is unlikely to uh, modify too much the biological properties of the molecule they are labeling. So therefore, they're uh, very, very useful in, uh, in nuclear medicine. And uh, this is a comparison to the point um, that I was making before that introduction of a halogen uh, shouldn't interfere too much with the biological properties of the molecule. And this is a comparison with, uh, with hydrogen. The iodination uh, method, um, will be governed by the oxidation state of, uh, of iodine. And iodine can exist either as iodine plus or iodine minus. As iodine plus, it will uh, lead to an electrophilic substitution. 
Um, nevertheless, the, um, the iodine plus ion doesn't exist free in solution. This is um, the free molecule iodine exists as a bipolar, so iodine plus, iodine minus. Nevertheless, the iodine plus species is not free, is usually uh, form complexes with uh, nucleophilic agents like water or, uh, or pyridine. Um, and this type of uh, electrophilic substitution um, can be done in mild conditions and is used for labeling of biomolecules, uh, peptide, proteins, antibodies, and uh, for protein labeling, usually the susceptible um, moieties for labeling are the phenolic ring of thyrosine or the um, imidazole ring of um, histidine. Nucleophilic substitution in which iron minus is the, is the reacting agent um, is used for uh, labeling of small molecule is also called the isotopic exchange reaction. Um, iron minus is less reactive as iron plus. The condition of reactions are harsher. The reaction, this type of reaction is done either in melt or uh, with reflux. So again, um, or small molecules, not biomolecules, are labeled using this. An example being uh, MIBG. The production, I will not speak too much to it because already Doug mentioned it. Iodine 1, 2, 3, it's expensive, it's cyclotron produced, it can be produced directly, but it comes contaminated, so not a high um, so carrier added. Um, and indirectly produced from xenon, uh, comes with high specific activity, so carrier free. And iodine 131 is produced in the reactor. It's either a byproduct of fission of uranium 235. And in this case, it comes um, uh, with a low specific activity because of the addition of sodium iodide for uh, coal sodium iodide for recovery. Um, or it is produced uh, via the N gamma reaction from tellurium 130. And in this case, it comes with high specific activity, so no, no care added. Again, I will go through the, um, uh, through the main radiopharmaceuticals um, labeled with uh, each of these radionuclides. Um, and it can be descriptive of time. So again, you have access to these slides. I will not read through them all. Um, sodium iodide, either labeled with iodine 123 or iodine 131, it's used for the diagnostic of, uh, of thyroid. The dosage will depend on the type of uh, radio label used. Of course, for diagnostic, it will be ideal if um, it will be done only with iodine 123. Again, uh, it's cost prohibitive, so many hospitals are using actually only uh, for adults, only iodine 131 uh, as diagnostic. Um, the pharmacokinetics, so the half-life, um, the half-time of iodine elimination from a thyroid is estimated to about 80 days. So it's the physical half-life of the uh, radionuclide that will govern the, uh, um, the time for imaging. Without taking into account the, the thyroid uh, uptake, the iodide leaves the body mainly by urinary excretion and just a little bit, uh, about 1% by fecal excretion. Um, there are several drugs that will interfere with iodine uptake, and this is a list of the drugs that should be uh, withdrawn uh, before doing an iodine uptake. Um, and here again, you have a listing of uh, other uh, diseases or other factors that can influence the iodine uptake, either by increasing it or uh, decreasing it. Um, a worthy mention of the, uh, the drugs labeled with iodine-123 is iodine-123 yoflupane or DAT scan, commercialized by GE Healthcare, uh, that is used uh, for um, diagnostic of Parkinson and differenti differentiation actually of Parkinson from, uh, from essential tremor. And um, the, uh, this is a, an analog of, uh, of cocaine that binds to uh, presynaptic um, uh, dopamine uh, transporter um, mechanism. And uh, it's used to examine the integrity of the dopaminergic uh, neurons. Um, this is a, an example of a normal versus an abnormal scan of that scan. And uh, 
the conclusion of usefulness of, of that scan from, from what I have read are a bit conflicting. Uh, a recent uh, meta review in Nature Journal mentioned that that scan was associated with a change in management, um, uh, clinical measurement of approximately half of the patient tested and the diagnostic was modified in a third of the patient scanned. Uh, nevertheless, other sources mentioned that DAS scan, it is available to help diagnose uh, Parkinson's disease, but will not add more information that cannot be uh, already achieved from the clinical exam. Um, and it's not used for, uh, uh, it's not a test used for monitoring uh, the progression of Parkinson's disease. Another classic is metaiodobenzyl guanidine or MIBG. Um, for diagnostic, either labeled with iodine-1 to 3 or, then, or iodine-1 to 3, 1. As iodine-1 to 3, 1, uh, it's not available for diagnostic use in Canada, um, unless um, special access. Um, but as iodine-1 to 3, it's, uh, it's available from G Healthcare as, um, as ad review. Sorry. Um, it is used uh, for the diagnostic of pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, neuroblastoma, or um, uh, to image the cardiac uh, innervation. The dosage will depend on the type of radionuclide use. Uh, mechanism of localization is governed by the um, um, nature of MIBG. It is an analog of guanidines. Um, and it's, um, it will share the same uh, transport pathways as uh, norepinephrine. Um, after administration, MIBG is cleared uh, quickly from blood and accumulates mainly in the liver. And the majority of MIBG is extracted by our kidneys. Um, and um, a small portion is eliminated uh, by the bowel. The time of imaging, again, will depend on the type of radioisotope used. Some adverse reactions have been um, noted uh, upon administration of diagnostic uh, MIBG, um, and it will also depend on the type of population um, in which is used and there, there are other comorbid comorbidities. Um, there are several drugs uh, that can interfere with the uptake of MIBG. So basically any drug um, that will block the norepinephrine uptake will interfere uh, with, uh, with MIBG uptake. And SNM has, um, has a guideline and where all these drugs are, are listed at with the time required for uh, withdrawal before administration. Um, and here is just a listing of the precautions uh, that should be taken when working with iodine. Um, it's obviously, uh, especially when working with uh, therapeutic amounts of iodine, uh, nevertheless, the, the diagnostic amount shouldn't be uh, neglected as well. Uh, so basically, one has to keep uh, in mind, besides the radiation exposure, the additional volatility of, uh, of, of this uh, um, radioisotope. Uh, so the work has to be done in the fume hood. If it's a septic work, it has to be done in a uh, biosafety cabinet that has a full uh, exhaust. And um, of course, the other appropriate alarm measures should be taken as well. Now let's talk about the indium 111 based spectra the pharmaceuticals. Indium 111 is produced in a cyclotron. It has a half-life of 2.8 days. It decays by electron capture. Uh, it's supplied uh, by, as indium chloride uh, in a low pH uh, solution because uh, um, indium um, is not stable at, uh, at high pHs. Uh, in order to stabilize it, sta stabilize it above pH uh, 3.4, it has to be complex with a weak chelating agents like sodium acetate, tartrate, or, or citrate. Um, and then uh, let's talk about the, um, 
the indium labeled uh, ready pharmaceuticals, first off indium DTPA that is prepared by adding uh, DTPA to a solution of indium chloride in an acetate buffer, pH 5, so again you have to use a weak chelating agent in order to stabilize um, indium and then this is heated at 100 degrees for about uh, 15 minutes. This product is used for cystinography studies to, um, to look at the flow of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain and particularly to diagnose the normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, it's, it's also been used for liquid gastric ending studies, probably in very, very, very rich hospitals, uh, when a dual isotope is preferred. Um, no known contraindication. Uh, it's very important because of its intrathecal administrations to take all the precautions necessary not to introduce hydrogens. Um, a little bit about the pharmacokinetics. Um, after, uh, again, intrathecal administration, it's diffused to the basal cisterns within uh, up to four hours. Um, and uh, images are usually done uh, within 4 to 24 hours after administration. Another indium label product is indium oxy uh, that can be prepared by mixing indium chloride again in acetate buffer pH 5 with oxy um, in ethanol and then the, the complex, it's a lipophilic contract, can be extracted into chloroform or methylene chloride, evaporated to dryness and then resuspended in, uh, in ethanol. Uh, GE is again the, uh, the supplier in Canada for the product um, and uh, it is supplied in vials because it tends uh, to adhere to all kinds of plastic including syringes. Uh, what is it used for? It's used for the labeling of white cells, uh, for infection imaging or for labeling of platelets. Um, the dosage is uh, between half to um, 0.8 uh, millicuries um, and it's not recommended for, for children, so for children technetium line 9 labeled white cells are recommended. Um, indium it is excreted in, in breast milk um, and um, we'll speak a little bit more during the uh, radio labeling of cells about this. Um, there are many drugs that can interfere uh, with the uh, biodistribution of indium labeled white cells. Um, how does it work? Um, once uh, incubated, when this product is incubated with uh, leukocytes um, in vitro, the, um, the lipophilic product will pass, um, pass, will diffuse passively into the cell membrane and it will bind to the, uh, the indium itself or bind to the cytoplasmic proteins and thus remaining tra trapped inside while the auxin is uh, recirculated. Um, well, again, we'll speak a little bit more about it uh, during the white cell uh, portion of this talk. Another worthy mention is Octreoscan, indium 111 labeled pentatriotride which is a DTPA conjugate of octreotide uh, that in turn is a, um, a stable um, um, analog of uh, somatostatin. And octreoscan binds to the somatostatin receptors in various tissues, especially the somatostatin receptor number two. It is supplied in Canada by curium. Uh, I know that right now there are other versions uh, out there, um, PET versions, and hopefully they are used uh, for diagnostic of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure there are areas in Canada where gallium dotate or copper 64 dotate uh, cannot be used. So this is still uh, the drug used to, to diagnose this, those conditions. Um, labeling is carried out by adding uh, indium chloride to the, uh, to the DPA, DDPA octreotide. Uh, incubation is done at room temperature, 30 minutes, um, and the administration is done within six hours from, uh, from compounding. Uh, like I said, it is used for localization of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. 
that are expressing somatostatin receptors. Um, and um, it is contraindicated in uh, any uh, patients that have a hypersensitivity to, to, to octreotide, to cold octreotide sandostatin, that should be also withdrawn before a uh, patient have this, uh, this scan. The localization, again, uh, it's a receptor binding process um, and it's eliminated. Uh, the biological half-life is about six hours. Um, and uh, it will also follow the normal biodistribution of somatostatin, uh, so normal pituitary gland uh, uptake as well, some thyroid, liver, spleen, and uh, urinary bladder. Like with most of radiopharmaceutical, the labeling EL should be more than 90%. The QC is not TLC, uh, but uh, it can be done by TLC, but the uh, approved method by the uh, supplier is uh, solid phase extraction using a C18 CEPAC. Um, and here you have the procedure. It's unlikely that you will do it yourself, but here you have a description. Worth mentioning again, thallium, um, although again, it's uh, probably one of those uh, really pharmaceutical that is being phased out. It's worth mentioning that thallium, um, thallium chloride was the first uh, successful uh, myocardial perfusion agent used out there. Uh, the radionuclide itself, thallium-201, is also a cyclotron-produced radionuclide. Um, it's still supplied in Canada by Curium and Lantius. Uh, I think, um, yes, still both of them, yes. Um, and um, it has a long uh, half-life, 73 hours, low uh, gamma emission, so not, uh, not ideal for imaging. And like I said, um, it's used for myocardial perfusion and also for viability studies um, because of its uh, redistribution properties. Um, it's also exhibited in, in breast milk and the mechanism of, uh, of uptake uh, is different than the uptake of um, uh, Systamibi um, or tetrafosmin uh, that are passive diffusion. Uh, thallium ion, cation is similar with potassium and therefore it's using the sodium potassium uh, uh, transport system. Uh, so it's an active uh, uptake. And like I said, uh, also um, different from, uh, from cystamibi and tetrafosmin, it, uh, it's redistributing after um, after washout. Um, the elimination is slow uh, with only 4 to 8 percent of the administrative administrat activity uh, in the urine within uh, 24 hours, so the biological half-life is long, about uh, 10 days. Here you have two examples of the uh, um, imaging protocols with thallium, so the first one up with just thallium, um, and the second one, um, a thallium uh, systamibi or thallium tetrafosmin protocol. Like I said, this is uh, the most used procedure in nuclear medicine, the cardiac imaging, so I'm sure you are very familiar with this type of uh, protocol. Okay, now a few words about uh, gallium-67 citrate. I know gallium-68 is now the uh, new kid on the block. Uh, gallium-67, again, a, a classic. Um, also produced in a, in a cyclotron from, uh, from zinc. Uh, it decays by electron capture. Um, it has low and high energy uh, gamma. The chemistry is very similar with indium chemistry, so again, not stable at high pH unless stabilized by, uh, by chelators. Uh, it's also supplied by Lantius and Curium, and I think one of them will discontinue their production soon. Um, it's used, uh, the gallium citrate, it's used for uh, imaging uh, tumor and um, tumors and inflammation. Um, and the, because of its use, there are many drugs that can interfere with, uh, uh, with the distribution, biodistribution of, uh, of gallium, all kind of chemotherapeutics, um, therapy, um, um, Radiotherapy can interfere uh, with uh, with gallium citrate uh, biodistribution. 
Um, the localization, uh, there are several theories on how uh, gallium citrate is, uh, is localized, and one of them being that the gallium-67 will, uh, uh, will bind to transferrin, and then that uh, complex is passed into leukocytes or tumors, where it will bind to lactoferrin. Um, it has a slow excretion, so imaging is performed late, uh, two to three days, um, and uh, sometimes laxatives or enema or enemas are recommended uh, to to see the uh, the abdominal uh, imaging. Just a word on xenon 133. It used to be very frequently used for ventilation studies uh, since the shutdown of the Canadian reactor. It's no longer available in Canada, um, but it is available elsewhere. So this is just an FYI. Um, it's a byproduct again of the fission of uh, uranium-235. Um, it comes in um, in in vials with a with a gas, um, and so therefore it has to be kept in a in a fume hood. Uh, it follows really the the air distribution upon inhalation. So like I said, it was used for uh, ventilation imaging. And now let's get to the radio labeling of autologous cells, and we'll talk about uh, red cell labeling with TEC and chromium-51, white cell labeling with TEC and indium-111, and platelet labeling. It can be done also with TEC and uh, indium-111. What are the applications of uh, radio labeled cells? Well, it depends on, on the label and on the cell. The white cell label Radio labels uh, are used for imaging of infection inflammations. The platelet labels are used for abnormal platelet deposition imaging um, or for uh, platelet kinetic and survival studies. The technician labeled RBCs are used for GI bleed or spleen imaging uh, or cardiac and vascular imaging. And the chromium labeled RBCs are used for red cell survival or blood volume and red cell volumes. So let's tackle first the red, uh, red blood cell labeling. Again, uh, some of their clinical applications. And what are the principles of, uh, of labeling uh, red cells with TEC? First, the cells have to be treated with, uh, uh, with tin because um, technetium aspartacnetate uh, is not retained in the cell, so it has to be reduced, and tin will do that. And once tin is added to the cell, it has to be removed uh, from the outside of the cells. Uh, and then uh, the pertechnidate is added uh, that will diffuse inside the cells, that it will meet tin, it will be reduced, and it will uh, be sequestrated inside the cell as TEC4 uh, that will bind to the uh, globin portion of, uh, of hemoglobin. So the methods of preparation of technetium uh, 99M uh, red cells will depend on the uh, type of tinning of the cells, whether it's done in vivo or in vitro, and um, how the addition of uh, technetium is done, whether it's done in vivo or in vitro. So the most used, ma used method is the in vivo and vivo method. So both the adding of tin and adding of protagonitate are done in vivo. And the kit most frequently used um, as a tin uh, source is uh, PYP, pyrophosphate, or glucoseptate can be used as well. Um, so you need about 10 to 20 micrograms of tin per, uh, per kilogram. Uh, so one milligram should do it uh, because maybe not all the tin is uh, is available. Uh, after tin uh, um, injection, um, there is a waiting period to permit uh, um, diffusion of um, of tin into the cell. Then per technetate is added about 25 millicuries, and again uh, a small waiting period to permit diffusion. And then the expected label efficiency of this uh, type of method is between 70 to 80, 85%. 80, 
It's very quick, it's simple, it's inexpensive, inexpensive. it can be done in any uh, nuclear medicine department, uh, but again, it has the lowest uh, labeling efficiency. Um, the in vivo in vitro method, so that means the tin is added still uh, in vivo directly to the patient, and then one waits for diffusion into the RBCs. And instead of adding tech directly, uh, direct administration to the patient, then uh, some portion of blood that is already tinned is withdrawn uh, and it's labeled uh, in vitro with uh, pertechnetate and then it's reinjected into the into the patient. So it has an increased label efficiency. It's also relatively simple. It can be done also um, uh, anywhere in any nuclear medicine department and it takes a bit of extra time and it has the potential of breaking sterility because you are withdrawing cells and reinjecting them. Um, there is a modified version of this method, so a modified in vivo in vitro method. Uh, the first portion is the same. Uh, again, once we uh, withdraw the blood for labeling with tech, and to further increase the specificity of the label, uh, one can uh, centrifuge the, the cells to select only the red cells uh, that are then uh, resuspended and labeled with uh, technetium with pertechnetate. Um, and then they are reinjected. So it, it achieves a high labeling efficiency, uh, same advantages as before, um, and um, it has also an increased uh, a disadvantage, uh, an increased potential for, for breaking sterility and it requires uh, a clinical centrifuge. And then the in vitro in vitro method uh, using uh, the ultratile kit, both thinning and addition of pertinitate are done in vitro. Um, a very uh, small amount of blood is collected between two and four milliliters of uh, anticholic coagulated blood is collected from the patient, uh, and that is added to a, to a vial containing already the, the tin. It's incubated at room temperature. Uh, the removal of excess tin is done by um, oxidation with hypochlorite. Um, and then pertechnetate is added, incubated at room temperature, and it gives a, a product with a high, uh, high uh, label labeling efficiency that is reinjected into the into the patient. Um, relatively inexpensive, again, yes, relatively. Um, and uh, it produces um, excellent delayed images. It's ideally suited for J-bleed studies. Uh, it takes extra time. It does need um, um, additional space, um, aseptic, uh, um, technique, uh, train staff, and so on and so forth. So it has a higher potential for breaking sterility because of the longer manipulation. There are several factors that can affect the radio labeling efficiency, the temperature, uh, short incubation time uh, can be done uh, if one raises the temperature to 37 degrees. The hematocrit obviously will, will affect the, the label. Uh, the amount of tin ion, so again, the best uh, kits uh, to be used are usually pyrophosphate or gluceptate. And the type of anticoagulant generally is agreed that ACD, acid citrate dextrose, is a better anticoagulant than heparin. Um, uh, we, we have done it uh, with only heparin and we didn't have any issues. Uh, as quality control for tech labeled RBCs, um, labeling efficiencies is something that should be done after each label, where you take a, a small portion of the of the label cell that are resuspended in sodium chloride, for example, um, uh, and then they are uh, centrifuge, um, and the um, the radio labeled is measured in the supernatant and in the sediment and calculating uh, the amount of label in the sediment. That would be the radio labeling efficiency. The viability, again, it could be done after each label or at least periodically, or when you have a new trained uh, personnel. 
uh, is using uh, tripon blue, that is a dye that will enter only cells that are dead. Um, and it's generally accepted that no more than 4% of the cells uh, should stay in blue. So here we have obviously a, a good example and a very bad example. Uh, sterility also can be uh, can be done, uh, especially when training uh, new personnel as a as a quality control measure. Heat damaged uh, technetium labeled red cells uh, are used for spin imaging. The procedure uh, um, is the same as the in vitro procedure, and an added step is to incubate. Uh, the label cell 30 minutes at 49.5 degrees Celsius. The temperature is very, very important. Um, the drugs that affect uh, the red cell labeled uh, distributions are drugs that can affect the cardiac function or the drugs that could, um, drugs or agent that can uh, diminish the, the radio labeling. Um, and here we have some examples uh, with heparin. Um, that's why um, it says that ACD is better than heparin because tech can form complexes with, uh, with heparin. Chemotherapeutic agents, uh, whole blood transfusions, um, iodinated contrast media also can interfere with the, uh, with the biodistribution. Just a word on uh, chromium-51 labeled RBCs. Chromium-51 for clinical use is no longer available in Canada. Um, it's um, for red cells is used for non-imaging studies uh, for RBC mass and survival and sequestration. The chromium-51 radionuclide has uh, a half-life of 28 days uh, and a high gamma energy. The principles of radio labeling are similar uh, uh, with the uh, protected tin uh, pair in the sense that it's also based on a redox reaction. Uh, chromium-51 as per chromate with chromium in oxidation state 6 is incubated with the cells. Uh, similar with uh, TEC, it will bind to the globin portion of hemoglobin. Uh, and then the reaction is terminated by adding a reducing agent like uh, ascorbic acid. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the, the protocol on how, how this is done with, with timing and, uh, and amount. Now let's talk a little bit about the white cell, uh, white blood cell labeling. Um, ideally, one would would prefer to label just the granulocyte portions of uh, of white cells, and this is most of the cells that we're labeling, since granulocytes are about 70% of the white cell composition. But usually, we are labeling a, a mixed leukocyte, so mixed granulocyte and uh, lymphocytes. We're not separating due to the additional um, risk of damaging the cells. What uh, are these used for? For imaging, uh, for localizing infection and abscesses. And um, the principles of labeling is very simple. The, uh, the radiopharmaceutical used is lipophilic in nature and it crosses any uh, cell membrane. So therefore the cells have to be separated. Uh, once inside the cell, the complex is uh, broken down and the radionuclide is retained in the cell. Um, so again, uh, the, the radiopharmaceutical used are non-specific, so the cells have to be separated before. So the two um, products that we are using for this scope are indium oxin and technetium 99M uh, hexametazim or HMPO. Uh, first, the blood is collected about 50 ml uh, with an anticoagulant and with a sedimentation um, agent, usually a hydroxyethyl hydroxy starch. Um, the ratio between the blood and the starch, um, so 5 to 1, blood to starch, or 10 to 1, uh, five to, so a high ratio if um, or more uh, hydroxyethyl starch if. Uh, if the patient has a uh, um, disease that, or a low white cell count. Uh, sedimentation usually, again, depending on the agent that is used and uh, the blood and the amount of blood and comorbidities of the patients between 20 to 50 minutes. Um, one, 
after sedimentation, the plasma and the white cells are separated from the from the red cells um, by a low centrifugation. Uh, optionally, the additional red cells that have not been separated in the previous step can be removed by HARP hyper or hypotonic lysis. And then the incubation with radioligand itself, oxin or HMPO, um, usually about 15 minutes at room temperature, um, removal of the excess non-reacted radioligand, and resuspension in either saline or, uh, or platelet poor plasma for, um, uh, for reinjection. And it's very important that the radio label cells are reinjected within one to three hours after. Uh, radio labeling, and this is just a schematic of what I've just talked about. Like I said, heparin or ACD are used as anticoagulant. Uh, we use heptastarch, haspan, as a sedimentation agent, um, and labeling is usually preferred in um, with oxygen, it's preferred in saline rather than plasma because um, the iodine 111 will bind to transferrin. Um, uh, very strongly. And this is a visual uh, comparison of how the sedimentation works. If you don't add a sedimentation agent, like here, if you use the only sedimentation agent that is clinically approved in Canada, which is Voluven, uh, or if you use Haspan, that is available under special access. And all these samples are after one hour of sedimentation. So um, Obviously, with a higher dextrin, so with a higher uh, molecular mass, the sedimentation process is much faster. Uh, similar with red cells, uh, one can look at the labeling efficiency, um, uh, viability. Again, very important, especially when something is changing the procedure or you have a newly trained uh, technician. Visual appearance, very important to look that there are no, no clumps. Sterility, again, can be done, especially when uh, qualifying new personnel. Uh, and biodistribution, um, high liver uptake means low viability, uh, spleen uptake, um, high spleen uptake, it means um, RBC contamination, and lung uptake at late time points uh, uh, means presence of clumps and irreversible damage. Several factors can, affect the radio labeling efficiency of white cells, the pH, the cell concentration. So uh, at least 10 to the 8 cells are recommended if you have this type of information. Usually, I'm not sure in other places, but we are doing radio labeling blindly, so we don't know anything about patients' uh, white cell count or other comorbidities. Uh, temperature, incubation time, and again, resuspension plasma versus saline. Um, the, uh, there are also factors that can affect the white cells chemotaxis, like drugs, uh, antibiotics, chemotherapeutics, steroids, or um, comorbidities, hyperalimentation, hemodialysis, uh, hyperglycemia. And it's very important to know the, um, the slight differences in, um, in oxygen versus uh, HMPAO labeling of white cells. Uh, the mechanism of retention in the cells are a little bit different. Like I said, oxygen is uh, um, um, in oxygen, uh, the endium will bind to the cytoplasmic uh, proteins. Um, and uh, in HAPO, the, uh, the lipophilic uh, compound once crosses the, the protein membrane, the cell membrane, sorry, it will be converted to the hydrophilic form and it will remain trapped and it can cross back. Um, the, the dose uh, administered is different, about 20 megabacterials for auxins, about uh, 370 for HMPO. Uh, delayed imaging time is all obviously uh, available for indium uh, uh, and not with tech. Uh, tech also displays some, uh, some bowel activity after one to two hours. Uh, with indium auxins, one can do simultaneous uh, tech sulfur colloid or tech MDP scans, depending on the indication. Platelets, like I said, can be labeled the same with indium or tech, because as long as you can separate them, uh, any cell can be labeled with this type of products. 
Um, and I will not speak too much about it. I just want to emphasize a little bit the uh, practical and regulatory aspects of cell labeling. It's very important to, um, to have a program for this uh, with uh, SOPs in place and trained personnel. And it's very important to identify specifically the patients, especially if uh, a facility does more than one cell labeling at one time. Um, the personnel that does this uh, procedure should have uh, heavy immunizations, should be again very well trained uh, and uh, should have um, part of the training should be also a septic technique uh, qualification. Um, and the final product should be identified properly with patient names and they should be cross-checked with at least another person before administration. Uh, the facilities grade A biosafety cabinets or isolators uh, like this one here, uh, a separate room, ideally from um, from every everything else, um, and obviously, like with uh, all the clean rooms, everything should be cleaned properly. And this is the uh, the layout of our radio pharmacy. Um, and with this yellow, you have the entire clean room. This is the ante room, and the um, the cell room is separated from the uh, the rest of the clean room where uh, the other ready pharmaceuticals are prepared. Uh, just one note that in Europe there is a, a kit called uh, Leuco kit um, that has all the um, um, reagents um, and all the materials needed for radio labeling of white cells and everything is sterile and closed so minimizing the risk for breaking sterility. And it's worth mentioning that uh, research-wise, radio labeling where, of white cells has been done using also positron emitting radionuclides and FTG actually has been used. And again, any type of cell can be can be radio labeled as long as it can be separated. Thank you so much. I know I'm a little bit over. Excellent, Mihaela. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes, so we could have a few questions or we could leave them till the end. I have a, a question, Mihaela. Um, earlier on today, a question was asked about um, the uh, role of the uh, Ontario Pharmacists Association and whether they have any influence on the way you run your operation. Uh, when you were talking about the uh, labeling of the white cells, et cetera, I uh, brought that to mind. So could you comment on uh, on uh, what the uh, Ontario Pharmaceutical Association regulatory body, uh, what, what effect it has? Yeah, um, we have been contacted in the past by the Ontario uh, Pharmacists Association or Ontario Pharmacists College. Um, and usually when I, when I say that I'm regulated by Health Canada because we distribute to other hospitals, they, they back away. Um, I've been consulted on, um, on how their procedures would apply to radio pharmacy, but the discussions haven't moved. So basically we are not overseen by them for the cell labeling procedure, for example, that is not covered by Health Canada. And neither are other hospitals, other nuclear medicine departments that do their own compounding are not overseen by the Ontario College of Pharmacy. So uh, uh, they haven't been asking about following the new, the well, not new, but the USP 797, et cetera, those type of regulations? No, so we had discussions, um, but they have, they have not been followed up. So okay. um, they say that at a later time, they'll look again into this. Sorry to catch you off guard there a little bit on that question. No, no, um, I actually answered it partially uh, when you asked it, but you, you didn't hear me um, at the time because of some technical issues. We had technical issues. 